It's Monday, November 21st. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Over the weekend, the man accused of being the so-called Potomac River rapist was found dead in his jail cell just days before he was set to stand trial for the raping and killing of a young woman and talented scientist. We hear from Paul Wagner, host of American Nightmare Unknown Subject, a true crime podcast that looked into this very case. The fact is, is that the chance that it was somebody other than Giles Warwick was one in one quadrillion. And we're also hearing from the victims of the Potomac River Rapist, who are reacting to the accused man's death. She called him a coward. She said she was deeply frustrated by this because she was waiting to hear whether or not she was going to testify. She wanted to look him in the eye. Thanks for joining us. I'm Luke Garrett. Megan Clardy is off today. And as you could probably tell, this episode may be disturbing to some. This is your chance to check in and see if you want to continue on. Giles Warwick was 62 years old, and he was supposed to have a hearing today for the 1998 rape and murder of Christine Mirzion, a 28-year-old woman and talented scientist. Warwick's criminal trial was scheduled for the end of November, but no more. Warwick was found dead in his D.C. jail cell around 8.30 a.m. Saturday morning. And with his death, the more than two-decade-old investigation into the Potomac River Rapist is practically over. Paul Wagner, host of the podcast American Nightmare Unknown Subject, has been following this case from the start. He actually broke the news of Warwick's death. Paul joins us now. Paul, thanks for being here. Hi there, Luke. Yeah, this is um, is something. Um, I don't think anybody really anticipated it, mainly, I think, because... um, he had been in the jail for three years mm. awaiting trial and was paying a uh, private attorney to represent him. So um, this was money out of his pocket. He was maintaining his innocence. And then uh, uh, the police say that he uh, he uh, died by suicide uh, on uh, Saturday morning. Mm. And context is really important here. There was a lot happening, as you alluded to. He had an attorney. There were a lot of arguments over whether DNA uh, would be accepted in court, and we'll get to all of that later on. But could you kind of chart out the path leading up to this moment where we are now? You know, what was happening in this criminal case? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was a lot going on. Uh, There were arguments back and forth between uh, Stephen Mercer, his uh, defense attorney, and the prosecutors from the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. And they were fighting over several things. Uh, One was whether or not the DNA that Giles Warwick gave the police voluntarily in uh, 2019 when he was arrested, whether or not um, that was obtained by the police in a way that was a voluntary rather than coercive. The defense was claiming it was uh, coercive and the police did it improperly, but the judge ruled in favor of the prosecutors. So so the prosecutors had won around there. Now, Giles Warwick had also won around himself in that when they searched the house in Conway, South Carolina, in November of 2019, they found what was called the consciousness of guilt letter. Hmm. It was a letter where it indicated um, in Warwick's words uh, – to his then fiance, that uh, he was leaving everything behind, that he'd signed over these titles, leaving cash for her and saying, uh, all my junk is yours. And he said, I'm sorry for all the mess you're about to go through. I just wanted to love you. Well, when the police saw that letter, that indicated to them that he was about to flee hmm. and that uh, this was a consciousness of guilt. And that's exactly what the judge said um, when he was first arraigned in D.C. Superior Court. But uh, he won that uh, argument hmm. in that his defense attorney argued that the, the search was not done properly, that it was overly broad, that they should have been that the police should have been far more specific as to what they were looking for. And instead, uh, Judge Milton Lee uh, agreed with the defense and said anything taken in that search should be thrown out because the the search warrant affidavit was not specific enough as to what the police were looking for. And so he threw that out. So Giles Warwick had a one one round here. And mm. so the jury the jury would not have been able to to hear about the letter. Uh, they wouldn't have seen it. They wouldn't have been able to read it. 
the prosecutors had won the third argument, whether or not the uh, interview that was done with Warwick after his arrest was done properly. Mm. And uh, the judge ruled in favor of the prosecutors in in that argument as well. So what was going to happen today, though, was that the judge was going to rule on whether or not the prosecutors could tell the jury about the rapes in Montgomery County that uh, Giles Warwick was accused of and that Mm. they had DNA in six rapes in Montgomery County. And so that ruling was going to come today. So the fact that he would sit in jail for three years, pay a private defense attorney, win at least one argument and maintain his innocence all this time, he maintained his innocence. And then suddenly he, uh, according to police, takes his own life. And so, Paul, you know, you've covered this story in this case so closely in the hours and days since Warwick's death. You know, what have we learned so far? Have you, you know, spoken to detectives and wardens at the D.C. jail about, you know, what happened? Was there notes? You know, was anyone else notified? Do we know? Now, I've learned some other things about Giles Warwick uh, that we haven't reported. It could have been playing on his mind. Uh, He lost his son in a motorcycle accident in Fairfax County over the summer. Mm. And then uh, another son was shot and wounded over in Prince George's County in uh, what police described as a dispute. He survived, but it could have been that um, these things were were weighing heavy on his mind. Uh, Of course, it's just speculation on my part. Those were things that were going on. So the other thing we did learn Uh, And one I was very curious about and I wasn't able to confirm until last night. And that is that he did not leave a note Mm. um, and uh, that EMS personnel who found his or actually responded to the jail indicated that uh, he had been dead for a long time. He'd been dead for several hours um, and that he had last been checked on at about midnight um, Friday night and then was found at eight o'clock. Uh, Saturday morning. So Mm. um, that's that's basically what we know. And so there's so much that, as you just laid out, that happened in the past few years only. He was arrested in 2019. But really, you know, the origin of this whole story is the tragic killing and and rape of Christine Muir Zion, which is what this case and trial is circulating about. You mentioned there's also these other sexual assaults that happened in Montgomery County that could have been included. But review with us really quickly that case and how that might have been weighing on him as well, possibly. Well, he was only facing the murder of Christine uh, at trial. Uh, But the prosecutors wanted to tell the jury about all these other crimes. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, that could have been weighing heavy on his mind that if if he lost that round, um, the jurors would have heard that he was accused of six different rapes in Montgomery County and another rape of a woman in the district in 1996. So and that was going to be argued in court today. It was supposed to be a hearing right about now. Mm. So um, that's basically where that all stood. So since he didn't leave a note, um, unless he spoke with a family member or a friend or a fiance or something, you know, before police say he took his own life, then we're not really going to know why right. he decided to do it. And Paul, through the podcast, American Nightmare Unknown Subject, you know, you've been able to speak with and get in contact with some of the victims and loved ones of the victims of the Potomac River rapist. Have you reached out to them and heard from them about their response to Warwick's death? You know, I got reaction on this from um, a woman named Kelly, who's the only a person who came out publicly to admit that she had been attacked by him. Mm. Um, She called him a coward. She said she was deeply frustrated by this because she was waiting to hear whether or not she was going to testify. She wanted to look him in the eye. And she had said that uh, when she had first seen his photograph, she said it was just pure evil. Mm. And then she, she also told me that when she listened to the last episode in the podcast, episode seven, which came out last week, Of course, we had included in that podcast the two interviews uh, that the police did with Warwick. And so it was the first time she'd ever heard his voice. Mr. Warwick, can you spell your first name for me? Giles, Giles. G-I-L-E-S. Okay, and middle name? Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L. And she said she was convinced and, and was certain that that was the voice of the man who had raped her 
back in 1991. Um, and then I also heard from David Hakos, uh, Christine's husband. Mm. He sent me an email. Um, he said it was emotional for him and frustrating. But at the same time, he said it was relief and uh, and closure. And, mm. uh, you know, David had been wanting to come to D.C. to look at Giles Warwick in the eye, but he's not able to do that now. Mm. Is there actually closure, you know, here? Do we know for certain if Giles Warwick, you know, did all of these things? I know for people who've been following the podcast and following this case over the years, is there a big question mark here or is this suicide, this death of Giles a form of admission? You raise a very interesting question. Um, I, I think to some people, they could reach that conclusion that, this was taking his own life was a way to say, I can't go on anymore. And, uh, and that it was an admission of guilt. Um, mm. we could never say that of course, cause we don't know. Right. Um, but you know, you know, DNA has come a long way, Luke, and, um, the juries want to hear it. They want to see it. And the fact is, is that the chance that it was somebody other than Giles Warwick was one in one quadrillion, one in one quadrillion. So, you know, the, the DNA just doesn't lie. There's mm. no wiggle room there. And so, um, you know, they had his DNA at eight different crime scenes. And so the one thing I really wanted to, to, to hear, though, from the prosecutors when they put on their case is what else were they going to be able to tell the jury? Right. You know, that because we never really saw much else that could tie him to these crimes other than the DNA and that letter that he left. But if you couldn't tell the jury about the letter, what were the prosecutors going to do? How, uh, that's the thing I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear their opening argument. I wanted to hear their opening statement. And we don't know what his defense attorney was going to say. We, uh, we don't know what the defense was going to be. And, and, uh, and Stephen Mercer, he won't talk to anybody. He mm. won't talk to me and, he hasn't said anything, but um, I don't know. Maybe now, um, now, that, now that Giles is gone, maybe he will talk. But um, right, I mean, information you know, is often locked up in court when someone you know is alive because they have rights. They have rights to privacy. They have rights of privilege information. But do you think this could be a opening of a door to information to fill in the holes of this case? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, a lot of information was put in the public record by the prosecutors. That's what helped our podcast so right. much. I mean, we learned a great deal about their case mm. um, leading up to, you know, weeks here. We were just two weeks away from trial. So I I had a lot of information in that podcast in those seven episodes, and we were able to listen to the interviews with Giles Warwick. You know, when he was asked by the police how his DNA got at all these scenes you know his response was i don't know and and but then in the same interviews he maintained his innocence saying he didn't do it he wasn't going to admit to something he didn't do so it was going to be an interesting trial i'll tell you that mm. um and because uh i wanted to hear what his defense was going to be right and uh right. and then i wanted to hear what else the prosecutors had that you know they could possibly place him at these scenes you know mm. Well, after you know two decades of covering this case, um, what what are you left with? What what are you thinking now that it's really all over? I know this this uh, this this man has been in my head for two years <laughs> because of uh, uh, this podcast. Um, you know, I covered Christine's murder initially. Um, I broke several stories about it along the way. Um, you know, I was the one that broke the story that there was a connection with the DNA. So I felt like, you know, I always had a, a hand in mm. in this case, you know, that not a hand in it. But I, I mean that I, I couldn't eye. get away from it. You know, it was yeah. like connected to me in some way. And to be honest with you, when I first heard Saturday morning, you know, that he was gone. To me, it was almost a relief, too, because mm. I've been emotionally overwhelmed with this case and and writing and recording and getting these podcast episodes out and talking to so many people, you know, it, it, it did take an emotional toll on me mm. in that it was a lot of work and I kept living with all these details in my head. So yeah. in a way it's a relief to me too, that I don't have to think about it anymore. Right. Um, you know, we will have one more episode. We'll have a wrap up episode 
you know, we're going to go back to some people and talk to them and get their reaction. And um, hopefully I'll be able to talk to the lead detective in the case. He wasn't allowed to talk to me, but now that Giles is dead, that he may be able to talk to me. So, mm. but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, Luke. I'm yeah. sort of a, it, it's, it's a kind of an emotional lifting and uh, weight off my shoulders because uh, you, you know, you get, when you're following a case like this, you, you know, you've got reams of paper and notes and things and interviews that you've got on your computer and it's always in your head. Mm. So, and the brutality of so, it all. I mean, these were brutal, brutal incidents. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I've got to know so many people that are involved, mm. um, uh, you know, one way or the other. And, and so, like I said, it's lived in my head for two years. And so, I'll be glad to get that last episode out of there. <laughs> well, we'll all be listening, Paul, and thank you for you know bringing us these latest updates and these latest findings in the death of Giles Bork. Thanks for having me on, Luke. And before we go to the break, if you or someone you know is experiencing extreme loneliness, anxiety, or depression, you can call or text the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 988. That's 988. Help is always available there. And after the break, we change the tone a little bit, lighten the mood, and talk about when is the right time to start hearing, playing, and listening to Christmas music. Stick around. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. Explain your DNA on, on 10 cases, man. You're inside the police interrogation room with the alleged Potomac River rapist. I'm not guilty on any of this stuff. So calm, so reasonable. Could this be the man who terrorized women for nine years before murdering a brilliant scientist two decades ago? Experience one of the most fascinating true crime podcasts available. Join crime reporter Paul Wagner for Unknown Subject, Season 3 of WTOP's American Nightmare series. Search American Nightmare Podcast on all podcast platforms. And before we go, we have Jacob in the house. What's up? For a big discussion about Christmas music and when it should be played. I should say, Jacob is an audio producer here at WTOP, and he's always ready to play. Oh, anytime. And I've researched a lot of Christmas music just for this segment. I'm glad you did, because I think it's a pretty big question. November 1st, you know, the day after Halloween, Mm. or the day after Thanksgiving, when should you start listening and partaking Christmas music? You know, what? when is the day? You know what? I've kind of embraced a philosophy in life. As long as you do something that doesn't hurt other people, then it's fine. You know, if it makes you happy, this is a terrible time of year. It's dark. <laughs> it's cold. True. You know, we go, I don't know why, but we go off daylight saving time. Right. It's it's dark. So, so then, you know, I... It's a dark time. Yeah. I, like, I look out the window and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's nine o'clock. And then I look at the clock. It's like, no, it's five. Wow. Yeah, you know, I, you know, that's sad. What I'm saying is, it's just like you know, Christmas lights, Christmas music, whatever it is, whatever holiday thing it is that you like, that you do, if it makes you happy, you know. Once Halloween's over, I I don't mind. Right. You know? You're saying like, if Christmas music brings you joy, then crank it up. Yes. I mean, within reason. I mean, I can only hear all I want for Christmas is you like so many times. Right, 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 right. But you're not going to be like anti. Like if you're in the car, you know, like driving somewhere with a group of people and someone turns on like 97.1 and the Christmas music is playing, you're not going to like turn it off and be like, no. Yes, I will. I will be like, no, we're going to listen to WTOP. Okay. (laughs) Let me (laughs) phrase the question then. Good call. That's a great call. You get a raise. I don't control your pay, but you get a raise. Um, All right. You're (laughs) in the car. Someone plays Christmas music on their iPhone. Sure. You're not going to grab the iPhone away and turn it turn off the Christmas music if it's pre-Thanksgiving. I mean, assuming we'd already listened to the DMV download, I'll say it's fine. Let's listen to some right, Christmas Right, right. You want to stay consistent. Okay, yeah. that's good. Because I'm of the mind, and I grew up always being like, you know what? Like, I don't want to overshadow Thanksgiving yes. with Christmas music. 100%. That was kind of like my feeling. I've stayed kind of true to that feeling. So I will honestly just be like, hey, nope, it's not time yet. I'm kind of a curmudgeon about about it. You know, I used to be like, you know, you got to wait till Santa shows up at the end of the parade. Right. And now Christmas has begun. <laughs> He's ushered in the season. But, you know, now I, I just feel differently. I just like, you know what? 
if it's going to be this cold this early, then you know what? Let's let's get Bring it started. On. Let's get it started. You know, let's get the trees up. Let's get the lights on. You know, whatever it is that you do, how you like to decorate, whatever you like to celebrate, hmm. let's get it started. You know, Jacob, that's a, a nice change of heart story where you're just like, if it makes you happy, be happy. Yeah, you know. At the end of the day. And I can't argue with that. I can't. Yeah. Thank you for enlightening me, Jacob. Oh, well, I'm glad I could help you out here. Wow. Well, that'll do it for us today on the DMV Download. We're brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602, and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. Let us know how we're doing, good or bad. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find us on social media and dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download podcast is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com, and, of course, on the WTOP News app. Have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow.